play of the championship game, which obviously we couldn't schedule every week, we could compete in prime time. The answer, of course, that we came up with was to have a cast of announcers which were different from any sports announcers that there had been before. We particularly wanted to change the role of what up until then had been called expert commentators. And the way we did that was with Howard Cosell and Don Meredith. Monday Night Football, that's how it all began. The ideas of those two men became a reality on September 21st, 1970, the Jets versus Cleveland in Cleveland. And Howard was there, and Dandy Dunn was there. Yes. Frank, where were you? Probably where you were, home watching it. Yeah. <laughs> I'd wanted to be there, Bob. Uh, Rooney talked to me in the spring of that year. I had one more year on a contract with CBS. Uh, we were both excited about Monday Night Football, but I had to fulfill my contract. Keith Jackson, who I actually think is the best play-by-play -play man in the business, was giving it the call. Uh, that first year, and I continued at CBS. The following year, Keith went to college football, and I joined these guys. <laughs> the brain trust was formed. Howard, do you remember opening night? Were you nervous? I was scared to death. It was a night that changed my life, and despite Dandy's protestations to the contrary, so was he, <laughs> and so was Keith. After all, we were part of a new testing challenge, a new experiment in prime time on a prolonged basis. And it was a memorable night. An all-time record crowd in Cleveland's Municipal Stadium. 85,000 people and more. The most celebrated star in the game at the time, Joe Willie Namath, and other greats like Leroy Kelly and Bill Nelson, top teams at the time. And it was the first year of pro football shotgun marriage, the merch. And the whole night became suddenly embellished by the richness of character and personality of the angular figure next to me, <laughs> as he described a Cleveland wide receiver known as Fair Hooker. Remember? <laughs> Fair Hooker Jr., right? Because <laughs> like we've never met one in our lives. <laughs> yeah, I remember. I remember a lot. Uh, I don't know if I knew enough to really get scared. I knew I didn't really know what we were doing. And, uh, but I thought it was a wonderful opportunity for me to bring expert commentary to the booth. And, uh, I was aided by six or eight monitors that were there in front of me. And I remember the original production plan was I would in turn spot what the teams were going to do and relay this down to the truck. And the truck in turn would focus in on the players. We were going to bring America not only uh, prime time Monday night football, but football as they'd never seen. <laughs> it is a hot, sultry, almost windless night here at Municipal Stadium in Cleveland, Ohio, where the Browns will play host to the New York Jets. Good evening, everyone. I'm Howard Cosell, and welcome to ABC's Monday Night Primetime National Football League television series. As you already know, each team has a superstar. The extraordinary running back, number 44, Leroy Kelly of the Browns. The premier quarterback, number 12, Joe Willie Namath of the Jets. The crowd expected to be in excess of 80,000. They're still coming in, and I think they will go past the 80,000 mark. And this game is underway on ABC. Cockroft knocks it to battle at the five-yard line. Mike Battle getting some fine blocking, wedged it out at the 25 and then broke it up to the 34-yard line before Freddie Summers came in to make the tackle for the Cleveland Browns. The ball is closer to the 8-yard line. It is third down. And goal to goal for Cleveland. This time Collins and Hooker both go to the left side, the wide receiver. Nelson the throw. Throws for Collins, touchdown! It was the first touchdown ever on Monday Night Football. Cleveland seven, Jets nothing. Both clubs added a touchdown before halftime. But the Jets are behind on the scoreboard by a score of 14 to seven. And the ball game for the second half is underway as Jim Turner kicks off. It goes to Homer Jones. Homer takes it at the six yard line for the Cleveland Browns and he breaks it in the open. Namath got the Jets moving in the third quarter, and they're ahead of the ball on the Browns' 10. 
First down and goal to go from the 10 for the Jets. Richard Kester, number 88, is in the ball game for the first time tonight. The big rookie. And up the middle goes Emerson Boozer for the touchdown. Boozer's score made it 21-14 Cleveland, but Cleveland added a field goal led by 10 with three and a half minutes to play. Go to throw. He's going deep into the corner for Sally. He's got it. One last drive for the Jets remain. First down, New York at their own 18-yard line. 47 seconds to play. The Browns lead 24 to 21. Before more than 85,000 people, Snyder almost gets named. The pass is intercepted. It is intercepted by number 52, Billy Andrews. Touchdown and no penalty. So the Browns won this one 31 to 21 despite a lackluster performance by their superstar Leroy Kelly. There's a depressed Joe Namath. Namath gets all the publicity because he plays in New York about his damaged knees but Nelson has had one more operation on his knees. His right knee is swollen. It was aspirated yesterday. He is truly an inspirational I think athlete. Uh, Howard, America is used to you now, but the comments you made during that first game caused quite a stir, didn't they? They sure did, Bob. And now they seem very tame. A decade later, those were the comments of a newsman that you would read in the papers daily. Nobody would take exception. But on the air, it was new and different. Your folks at home accustomed to listening to home announcers, trained in a different way. In that game, Leroy Kelly carried 20 times, gained 62 yards. He was not a compelling force. And it was true about Bill Nelson. His knees were even worse than Joe's. But New York is the media capital of the world, and Joe's knees got more attention. I remember it well, as Dandy would say. I remember it well that since that first game, people have been <laughs> asking me, what is Howard Cosell really like? And... I started paying attention from that first game because I didn't know what you said. Oh, that, uh, you know, it sounds kind of right to me. Oh, sounds like a good idea to me. <laughs> Hello again, everyone. I'm Howard Cosell. Welcome to still another Monday night of NFL football right here on ABC. We look for a super game tonight. These days, when one makes a long trip, one must choose one's transportation very carefully. I choose luxury and economy. My Datsun 280ZX. It has all the luxuries to make a long trip comfortable, and it has the cruising range to make a long trip possible. The Datsun 280ZX. More miles per tank full than any other sports car you can buy. We all should have one. Wow! It's a long way to empty. Chapter 9. I kicked in the door and shouted freeze to the lone figure in the room. Even in the darkness, I could see she was the most beautiful woman I ever met. Then I saw the light beer from Miller. It's got a third less calories than a regular beer, and it's less filling, she whispered. But the best thing is, it tastes so great. Suddenly, all the pieces fell into place, and I knew I'd come to the end of a long, long road. She poured, and we drank. To be continued. Light beer from Miller. Everything you always wanted in a beer, and less. Well, we've seen how uh, Monday Night Football got started, that first great game at Cleveland. Why don't we reminisce for a while about those early years? Howard was being controversial, Daddy Don was being entertaining, hmm. and you appeared on the scene. Do you guys have, <laughs> uh, trying to get a word in edgewise, do you have favorite moments, favorite games, a particular performance by a player that you remember? Well, Dandy right. probably has 500. I've got many. But I think we should begin with the giffer, who appeared, as you said, on the scene. <laughs> <laughs> There's a television first. Let's begin with the giffer. <laughs> you know, Bob, I know you played this game at Florida State, and there are special moments for a player, or a former player, when he sees something happening. And we got a picture of it, the very first play of a game we did in 1975. A very great athlete, O.J. Simpson. And it really is amazing. He's only been out of the game a couple of years, and... 
And we already have forgotten a little bit about how just extra special he was. How many yards did he gain this particular night you're talking well, about? It was, uh, like I say, Buffalo against Cincinnati in 1975. He gained 199 yards. It was his, ultimately, his second best season ever in pro football. He gained over 1,800 yards, but he really put on a show that night. It was mid-November in Riverfront Stadium, and O.J. was in his prime. It was his eighth season and his fourth straight over 1,000 yards. That night, the juice literally carried Buffalo, as he did for so many years. In the first half, he broke runs for 66 and 44 yards. Yes, it was vintage juice, mellow, sparkling, at his prime. This run brought all of O.J.'s skills to light. The speed, agility, his great reflexes, watch him get back on his feet, and his willingness to, well, tough out those final yards. What a career that man had. He won the Heisman Trophy in 1968 while at USC. He became the second leading rusher in the NFL behind Jim Brown. More 200-yard games than any other running back. Most touchdowns in a single season. And his 2,003 yards in 1973 should stand as a record for many years to come. O.J. Simpson is retired now. Frankly, I'll never forget that remarkable night in Cincinnati five years ago. O.J. was always special, but on Monday nights, for some reason, something extra happens to oh, all does. the players, right? Yeah, it really does. Howard, do you have a moment that you remember that's special? I do, but quite at variance from Frank's particular memory. It was a night... What's new? <laughs> <laughs> it was a night when the three of us, these three magnificent mentalities, the Pro Football Hall of Famer, the extraordinary quarterback of yesteryear who always failed in the title game, <laughs> and yours truly, the iconoclast who never played the game, proved that we could set record lows for imbecility. It happened in Three Miami, Florida. Mm -hmm. Pittsburgh against Miami. Dick Anderson had intercepted four passes, an extraordinary night. We got down to the very end. Less than two minutes left. Fourth down. Inches to go. Miami holding the ball on their own 11. That's when we proved ourselves as magnificent incompetence. <laughs> <laughs> that much. And it could be. They're going to go the for The Dolphins it. will go for it. Keep in mind, now they've clinched their division. They have 144 remaining. I like this kind of style. Now, here it is. This is really a good play. Now, you got an inch to go, a couple inches to go. And I would imagine the way Shula's looking at it, he says, if my offensive team cannot make two inches, then he, by golly, they don't deserve to win. You know, he went for it in the Thanksgiving Day game against Dallas. Didn't make it. Admitted in the post-game interview that perhaps he had made a mistake, yet he's got the courage to try it again. If this capacity crowd or near capacity crowd on their feet on fourth down, will it be the big man talking? I believe they might have taken too much time. Boy, if you did, you're going to hear some kind of booing here in the Orange Bowl. Now then, you got a punt. Yeah, there's no question now. Well, there seems to be one because I don't see any punters coming on the field. That's it. Shula, I think it just disgusted. Said, go for it anyway. There it is, delay of the game. Well, now, I don't understand that. No, I don't either. Well, how about that? All right. And just a little over five yards is needed by the Miami Dolphins. And, boy, if they miss it down here, Pittsburgh is going to have the ball. I don't understand. Inside the 10. I don't get it. I don't get it either. I don't understand. Yeah, I don't think Paul lead. Brown gets it on Nick Scorich gets it either. Well, this is really funny looking. All right, let's watch it. Fourth down, a little over five. Crazy's oh, going to take there the safety. He has a safety. Sure. Shula's ahead oh, of us all. Yeah, he is. That's why he's there. Shula's ahead of us all. That's it. Why did not think of that? The best that ABC has to offer, folks. <laughs> what happened, guys? I still think he should have gone with the first down. <laughs> what you have to understand, Bob, is that 
It was a late night in Miami, <laughs> and the moon was in full blue. That explains everything. And we flat blew it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Danny, Don, it's your turn. We're yeah. reminiscing about the early years. Do you have a favorite moment? Moment. Boy, hey, do I have some favorite moments. <laughs> and all of them are captured right here in a mind like a steel trap. <laughs> <laughs> I think, really, you, we always looked at the, you know, at the schedule and said, boy, this is going to be a super ball game. We've got these two teams. They're great contenders. And so, several times, it's just been a disaster one thing to blow the other one out of the way but the one that'll really get you is late in the season when we've all seen a lot of football we'll see two teams that are going to play they're out of it there's no way they're going to make the playoffs or anything say, oh man this is going to be awful uh-huh oftentimes those games turn out to be really exciting and one i remember is uh well i remember well of course it was 1971 in san diego uh-huh <laughs> Start those games at 6 o'clock out there. I remember those a lot easier. <laughs> San Diego was playing uh, St. Louis, as a matter of fact. And it was like, uh, I think the score was 10-10. About three or four minutes to go in the ball game. John Hale was quarterback. Terrific finish. I like games like that. Tied up. Cardinals 10. The Chargers 10. Hale on a rollout option. Jeff Green touchdown. I want to tell you that Hadel is a darn good quarterback, and he's a man. When he refused Dykus' play that Gilman sent in and went over, he established for everybody in this ballpark his leadership qualities. But Jim Hart had leadership qualities, too, and St. Louis came right back. We have 57 seconds remaining to be played. Gray goes left. Up to the right is Gillian. The Cardinals with two timeouts. Play to Edwards. Edwards to the two. Good ball by Hart. What a ball game. What a ball game. So it's all boiled down to this. 20 seconds remaining to be played in the game. The Chargers lead 17 to 10. The second down, the ball is on the two yard line. The big man gets the call. Edwards, he up in the air. Edwards. That tied the score at 17, and then the Cardinals made a critical mistake, a mistake that, uh, frankly, surprised all of us. The onside kick attempt, this is just to make sure it's not run back, but it will give San Diego possibly two plays, maybe even three. I don't know whether I'd have done that. I don't not. either. Got them in pretty good position. hadel has got to hit one pass now. One pass 15 yards. Field. They've got two timeouts left. I think that's one we can legitimately second guess, Dandy. He needs a field goal. He has a punt kicker, Dennis Barty, who has kicked one from 52 yards this year. So he needs approximately 10 to 15 yards to have a good shot at winning this football game. Mark's right. Garrison left. Garrison. There goes that timeout. Garrison to the 37. Timeout, San Diego. Five seconds to go. Round in. Okay. All right. He's hit on 125 yarder. He's kicking from the 45. Let's watch. It looks good. It is good. How about that? They're mobbing Partee. Unbelievable. Partee is in there. That, the game is over. Just as the can goes on. The 70s was also the decade of the cheerleaders in the NFL, and we made the most of it on Monday night. Put your little foot, put your little foot, put your little foot right here. A bevy of beauties. Well, you won't see this for a playboy. Yeah, maybe we should. What do you get for a McDonald's price? For a McDonald's price? I get my wife out of the kitchen. It's my night off. Oh, I get myself a Big Mac and a Coke, and I still have time to catch my next class. Thank you, sir. What do you get for a McDonald's price? A lot more than simply your money's worth. We get our big league celebration on our little league budget. Right. Yeah. You deserve a break today. Nobody makes your day. Nobody can give you all this at a McDonald's price except McDonald's. This ranch doesn't run without horses. 
And the horses don't run without you. But when you've hammered out a day's work, you meet up with Miller time. When it's time to relax. Time for the best tasting beer you can find. One beer stands clean. Miller High Life. If you've got the time, we've got the beer. Sunday, the new hit show that's fascinating, startling, and fun. Those amazing animals. This is the year of your love story. Lee Reed Jewelers. Remember the magic of your first days in love. Savor the warmth of another year in growing together. Celebrate the times of your love with a bouquet of anniversary diamonds from Lee Reed. A gift of diamonds is the most personal way to whisper the words of love on your anniversary. And Lee Reed will show you the many ways to give the gift of diamonds that will last forever. Celebrate the times of your love with a gift of anniversary diamonds from Lee Reed, your love store. I give up my whole Sunday to help a buddy paint his boat, and he gives me a light beer. You ever taste light beer? Try a Coors Light. It's a surprising taste of Coors Light. Not bad. It comes from pure Rocky Mountain spring water and high country barley. It's good. Really good. And a way of brewing that squeezes a lot of the calories out but leaves all the taste in. Well, I'm surprised. Coors Light. The surprise is how good it tastes. News Watch 6, a part of the spirit. Monday Night Football is a game that, uh, it's the only game being played that, at that particular time. Uh, it's kind of like uh, the playoffs of the Super Bowl in that it's the only game being shown that day. So therefore, you have uh, the varying audience of, of your peers, the people that play the game, and you want to do well. You want to do well because the guys that you play against, they're watching the game. Well, Monday Night Football started something about 10 years ago, and uh, I hope it keeps on going. It's a special night. You see some of your best football games on Monday night. I've seen a lot of people lose and a lot of people win on Monday night. Special game, and we like Don Meredith. I think that uh, Monday Night Football has, has uh, made a lot of, uh, I would call them Monday Night Widows also, but I, uh, I know my wife likes to watch uh, the game with me if we're not in it. And uh, it's, it's very relaxing to sit at home and watch someone else beat their brains out. My mother's watching, and uh, therefore I have to play better because I'll get scolded on Tuesday if I don't. You know, I really believe that Monday Night Football has become American tradition for a lot of sports fans. But I think it's about time we as football players and as sports fans do something about one Don Meredith's announcing ability. Right, Nindy? It's just another game. I, I think every game's important. Uh, we don't treat one game any different than any other, and they're all important, and uh, it's just as important as we do when playing on Sunday. Well, nobody had to put any dynamite in our britches because when we went out on Monday night, we were ready. One of the worst things that ever happened to me in my life was in 1970. We were playing the Cincinnati Bengals, and they, Howard Cosell asked me to come out and do an interview, and as I walked up to the, to the uh, uh, sideline there where they had the cameras set up, he... Got, he had his microphone. He said, ladies and gentlemen, walking towards me now is a National Football League's number one flop. <laughs> I could have killed him. Well, actually, it kind of messes us up a little bit because it, it makes our week different. It makes our practice routines different. And especially if you have to go to the West Coast and come back and then play a Monday night game. It's, it's an inconvenience for us. As far as the guys in the booth, I've always felt that Frank's done a great job and, and Danny Don or or fans certainly know what they're talking about, but but the other guy, the one that has never played the game, I just it just amazes me how much he really knows about it. He's he got all the terms and the numbers. For a guy that never played the game, he certainly knows very little about it. <laughs> no, Howard's been very, very good to me. I like Howard. That's how some of the players and coaches feel about Monday night football. But, you know, Monday Night Football has really become a phenomenon in this country that's affected the fans at home and in the stadium probably even more than the players. Some very strange things happen on Monday night in the fall in this country. <laughs> Isn't that absurd? Oh, well, well, it all oh, could be tragic unless that's the gentleman exactly knows what he's right. doing because the line is strung completely across the stadium. How they got it there, we don't know. And how, how will they get them get down, down Kev? The that's problem. the more important question. Commandment number one, thou shalt, shalt keep, keep Monday night, night holy and tune in early. Commandment number two, honor thy holy point spread, for it is right on. Commandment three, 
Thou shalt, shalt not covet thy neighbor's beer. Commandment four. Thou, thou shalt, shalt not commit adultery during halftime highlights. Commandment five. Thou shalt stay tuned until the final gun, for the spread may change. Commandment six. Forgive, forgive those who bet against their home team, for they know not what they do. And now the commandment after. Prepare for the day when the Super Bowl is played on Monday Night Football, for on that day there will be heaven on earth. Monday, Monday, play it on Monday, 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 play it on Monday, 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 Monday. Monday. Hey! It is good. Ever since the Industrial Revolution, Mondays have been a depressing day, the first day of a long week. And then came Monday Night Football, a great invention for the working man. It gave him a perfect ending to this day. And we here in Santa Barbara at the Mecca of the Church of Monday Night Football have been worshiping for years Monday Night Football. And we think millions of Americans have too, maybe in their own homes or in bars across the nation. And now we have chapels or parishes across the nation known as the Church of Monday Night Football. And we feel it's the great answer, a perfect ending to a normally dismal day. I guess if you took a survey of when film sets closed down, you'd probably find out that they're earliest on Monday night so people here in California can get home and watch Monday night football, which is at 6 o'clock out here. Here's to good friends, tonight is kind of special. The beer Building the inspector. Pool. Hey, Let's what are you guys doing here? I didn't believe you two could build your own house. Yeah, well, don't look. It's not finished. Well, I guess we'll just take our lone brown go home. Well, maybe one quick look around. <laughs> when you want the taste of a truly great American beer, tonight, let it be low and brown. What are you going to do when you finish this place? Just what I'm doing right now. John Burns joined the Army in March and kept us waiting until October. Kathy Wolf joined the Army in May and kept us waiting all summer. If you're a high school graduate or about to be, you can join the Army now and take up to 12 months to report for duty. That way, if you qualify, we can guarantee you the skill training that makes you happiest. And we think a happy soldier is worth waiting for. This is the Army, a chance to serve your country as you serve yourself. Call this number toll free. All right, guys, we have talked about the early years of Monday Night Football. So let's talk about the more recent years, the memorable games, some memorable moments. You all have one, I'm sure. Howard, Frank? Uh, we've had some beauties the last few years. You know, I think in terms of great individual performances, we had one in 78, third game of the season. And as Don mentioned, the most improbable things happen in games where, you know, you're concerned they're not even going to be a good game. Uh, we had Baltimore and Dallas in the opening game of the season. Bird Jones was out of the lineup. Dallas beat Baltimore 38 to nothing. We had them two weeks later in New England. Mm -hmm. We go up and figure this is going to be an absolute wipeout. New England heavily favored in the game. And we saw an incredible performance by Joe Washington, who had just arrived at Baltimore. Bird Jones was still out of the lineup. But Joe Washington put on a show like no football player I've seen in the whole series of Monday Night Football. Lots of rain that night, right? Oh, it was boring. It's a rainy night in Boston town. Bill Cosby will call in a moment. First and ten Baltimore. 46-yard line. They're home. Dallas goes to Washington, and he can pass. He has a man wide open. He's got Roger Carr. Roger Carr. How do you like that? I like it. Joe Washington. 54-yard Baltimore touchdown. Well, they call him napping. He's got Joe Washington all right alone. Open. It's yes, sir. Oh, that was pretty. He had him on Nelson most all the way. And at 27-27 in the final two minutes, Joe gave us an on -board. Wilson. This is Joe Washington. That is Joe Washington. Look at this. That is oh, Joe Washington. He stays on his feet. He has great speed. That is Joe Washington. Oh. <laughs> How could it happen? Oh, what a football it. game this turned out to be. How about Joe Washington? Will you believe Joe Washington's night? You couldn't have a greater football game. And this Baltimore team has really come to life under the worst possible circumstances. And the guy who's done it is Joe Washington. 
Washington, who has acquired almost quietly. <laughs> Look at Brook, Steve Brook. The, the thrill victory of victory and the agony of defeat. What a night Joe Washington had that <laughs> night. Do you suppose, Frank, that that was the single best performance on a Monday night football game? The best I can recall over the 10 years. And in all-around ability, he did it all in uh, everything you could ask of him in, in conditions where he really needed the uh, swim fans and the snorkel. <laughs> <laughs> he wore the goggles. Remember, he had the goggles. Yeah. didn't have the thing. The automatic <laughs> wipers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was a good one, all right. He did good. I think it's really hard to pick out one guy that's, that said, hey, this was the best because we've had so many. Lynn Swans, uh, Earl Campbell, O.J. There's been a lot of them. A little broader scope. Let me paint a bit, you know, broader scope for the entire series. Yes. I've had a tendency to kind of pull for the quarterbacks through the team. You may not have noticed Can't that. Can't imagine one. Well, I don't know. It's lonely out there. The There's... Matisse about done. Pardon me? No, oh, Matisse. <laughs> I know Matisse. Uh, there's one guy that's really has not disappointed me too much for the... 10 years that we've been on this air, and that's that left-handed snake from Oakland. Oakland always plays well, but Kenny really seems to play well on Monday night. So I think for a series, I'd have to rate him very high as the outstanding player for the 10 years. Kenny Stabler is 34 years old and now with Houston, but Dan DeRue is absolutely right. He played so well on Monday nights, he can never be forgotten during the decade of the 70s. What you're seeing here is the brilliant manner in which he could diversify his receivers. 21 was Cliff Branch, 49 Mike Ciani. Wherever the man was open, he could find him. He was 9-1-1 one one on Monday Night Football, and he won his last nine games consecutively. He was the picture passer in the pocket. Never had the great mobility, he had the bad knees. But he could do what he had to do as well as anybody we have ever seen during those 1970s. And he was a leader from top to bottom. There was a game a year ago in New Orleans when the coach put in a substitute for him. He was so beaten up, but he refused to leave the gridiron. And he pulled from nowhere a miracle Oakland victory over the Saints. 88, you'll remember Ray Chester. He would find others too, as in this case, number 84, Derek Ramsey. But for the showdown, always the incomparable tight end, Dave Casper. So, the snake and the memories of brilliance in the 70s. The Raiders' fortunes on Monday night have often delighted fans, but a 72 rump in Houston caused, well, a different reaction. Right there is a vivid picturization of the excitement attendant <laughs> <laughs> upon this game. The number one in the nation. You can lead a dodge into the pub, but you can't make a drink. Wow, it's a long way to empty in a Datsun. Datsun pickups, up to 25% better mileage than their biggest competitor. And Datsun King Cab is the roomiest small truck ever. Only one with jump seats inside the cab. Wow, it's a long way to empty in a Datsun. We are driven on the way. Hatfield's gas pipes were leaking half our gas, but the town couldn't afford a contractor to fix them. See if you can break it So when Bill Sanders of Phillips showed us gas pipe made of their plastic and how to install it ourselves, we were in hog heaven. With some willing hands and some expert advice from Phillips, now Hatfield, Arkansas is really cooking. And that new pipe paid for itself in a year. Phillips Petroleum, good things for cars and the people who drive them. And for Dan DeRue, Kenny Stabler, for the Giffer, Joey Washington, for Bob Yurick, a night of memories. For me, because we are diverse personalities, and we each have our own very deep feelings about life, there was the opening night of the season last year in Foxborough, Massachusetts, when a packed house stood and paid tribute to a remarkable athlete, number 84, Darrell Stingley. We interviewed him that night.
his first interview ever since the tragic encounter with Jack Tatum. And then this tribute from the hearts and minds of all of those people in the stadium. What a night. What a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, we would like to make a very special player introduction. Please give a warm New England welcome to a very important member of the New England Patriots who is seated in the press box tonight. Number 84, wide receiver, Darrell Stingley. Darrell Stingley making his first return visit. There's an absolute capacity crowd here, a standing ovation for number 84, who was injured, of course, tragically, last October, August the 12th. He has returned home. He is going to be executive director of playing personnel. Has a very optimistic outlook on his future. Has regained movement in his right hand after being fully paralyzed for so long. This is a moment to remember as one pans the stands, looks at these people, one realizes what an athlete can come to mean to a population. And this has been a remarkable athlete, number 84, Daryl Stinger. And it happened on August 12th, a year ago, the collision with Jack Tatum. Not only were the fans applauding his teammates on the sidelines, tracing up to the press box, applauding number 84. It's impossible to really try to imagine what's going through his mind. It's, it's something that's so far beyond most of us. Those faces are lit up as if they are one. And from the way Darrell was greeted when they wheeled him into the administration building here tonight, as the tears rolled down his face, you know what they meant to. And those players, they poured in to see. Let the moment speak. I suppose it would continue for many, many more minutes. Darrell, I'm sure, would not want that to be. The ovation continues as play. Well, it cannot be resumed as Steve Grogan obviously cannot call the snap numbers. And Grogan leads his teammates away from the line of scrimmage, applauding Daryl Stingley. is eternal and these people want him to know that their hope for him is eternal too you know it's really gratifying to see so many guys today enjoying tobacco without lighting up just like me they've gone smokeless now i'm kind of partial to skull with the wintergreen flavor or for straight tobacco taste try copenhagen or mild happy day. Great if you're just starting out. There you go. But whichever, just a pinch between your cheek and gum is all it takes. So try going smokeless. You're gonna like it. How elegant. What wine is that? It's going to be an evening to remember. Mmm, this is a lovely wine. A Chablis. I don't know how she does it. She's a great hostess. Look how everything glitters. My favorite, Chablis Blanc. When you invite your favorite people, invite their favorite wine. Cool, crisp, gallo Chablis Blanc. Well, we've talked about a lot of great moments on Monday Night Football. Some of them moments of great athletic prowess. Some very touching moments. But can you guys come up with, in 10 years, the greatest football game played on Monday Night? For me, it's easy, Bob. It happened two years ago in the Astrodome in Houston, Texas. Houston against Miami, both teams striving for playoff berths. 
which each would ultimately achieve. Mm -hmm. An extraordinary contest, offensive-minded, 35-30, Houston won it. An unbelievable night for the then-rookie Earl Campbell. But perhaps most importantly, that crowd, all of them with the ice blue pom-poms, love you blue, singing the Houston fight song, Houston Oilers, Houston Oilers. It was a great night. It synthesized and yet it now, epitomized huh? it's the, the fact that professional football remains the golden sport in this country. Danny Don, do you, you agree with that, or do you have another game you think might have been better? Uh, I don't think I would have said it exactly the same way. However... I do think that that's probably one of the top games that we had for a lot of reasons. He mentioned Campbell, the fact that Campbell was a rookie and had a great college career and come out uh, to the pros. You never know for sure where they're going to make it. And I think he, there's no doubt after that. And Plus, it was a great football game. It was really was a good, high-scoring football game. And I like those kind of games where you just got to put the ball in the air and let it go. Yeah. I think yeah. we all agree on that. We've talked about it. It yeah. was a fascinating night. Howard covered the crowd. It, it the only thing he didn't cover was the fact that he stood up at halftime and led them from the booth. <laughs> I think that really got him in gear for the second half. The one thing we didn't touch on in commenting on the game was the absolutely unbelievable performance of Bob Greasy. He played as fine a game as a quarterback that I've ever seen him play. He was perfection, and yet, through the strength of Earl Campbell alone, Houston won that football game. The score was tied 14-14 in the third quarter when Houston went to their main man. Houston picked up a Willie Alexander pass interference, and Miami had the ball of the one. Miami is a first and goal. Harris, touchdown. Harris tied the score at 21. Then in the fourth quarter, Miami was forced to punt. Roberts looking for the corner. Oh! The punt, one of the finest you will see, put Houston deep in the hole. 12-25 remaining in the football game. It's tied at 21. That is regulation play. Pastorini from the end zone, safety. Oh! Houston stopped Miami after the safety, and then Pastorini went to work. It was wild. Houston drove the ball to the Miami 12 and trailing 23-21, Pastorini again called on Campbell.
in this arena, America's football team. Greasy would not give up, and he brought the Dolphins back. 28-23, New Orleans over the Dolphins. Going for Tillman. That is deflected into the arms of Steve Kiner. That flag goes out. Out. Flag down, flag down, but that should do it. At 28-23, all Houston had to do was run out the clock. But you can't walk on oil. That's what the sign says. Over 700 yards gained by both teams on offense. Just a great game. On second and eight, Campbell just outruns everyone to the right. Look out. He's gone. He makes it all the way. Puts his head down. 80-yard touchdown. This is over. What a show this man has put on tonight. All right. And around the block of Wilson. Turned on that speed. Went down the sidelines. Forget it. What you have seen tonight, ladies and gentlemen, is a truly great football player. In the late moments, take total personal command of a game. And you have seen the Houston Oilers on national television establish that they are an exceptional football team. They're they're beating a great team tonight. Watch it again. Look at him go around that block. See that block to the and that block. And that was all he needed. And Toll had no chance. He knew he couldn't catch him. And no way that Curtis, Curtis Johnson, Johnson was tried to track him down and put. And it's officially 81 yards. An extraordinary personal performance. An extraordinary team performance. The Houston Oilers. An underpublicized team. An underrated team. Look at those statistics. 199 yards, 28 rushes, four touchdowns. What a football play. What a game. And our congratulations to an exceptional Houston football team. Gentlemen, if I might make a humble observation, never has there been a, a group assembled in a broadcast booth like the three of you. There's a very special chemistry. And... I think that's the reason why a lot of people watch when the score is 35 zip in the fourth quarter. Now, what do you think about that idea? Why do you suppose people watch? I think mm. there's something to what you say. I think the primary reason is the product. Monday Night Football has for a long time been in its golden age, and I see no foreseeable decline in its popularity with the American public. As for the other item, the three men in the booth, yeah, I think it's a factor. I'm an opinionated man. Many disagree with me, which they have a right to do. That causes interest and commotion. This is a man rich in the American texture who often disagrees with me, and the public likes that. And the third man is the man who represents the American hero, professional football hall of famer, an admirable person, individually in terms of character put the three together you've got an admixture that you don't have anywhere else in sports broadcast Don? well there should have been a lot of things happening you know i think in 10 years it's i don't i don't know what all that stuff is either i have sometimes thought maybe that howard does have a lot of things to say and uh, i think it's nice to have somebody there to sort it out and explain to the folks what he said. And uh, <laughs> somebody's got to do the job, you know, uh, do it. And then we do the best we can not to get in Frank's way. And uh, we don't do a good job of that. I mean, he, just, <laughs> he does. Right. No, I think there's a lot of, maybe that's some of it. I think there, there's three people here. I think basically we have a pretty good time there. And I yeah. think people like that. But I really do think that it's the ball game. I mean, it's, there's a, there is a sports mentality that that's what gets the folks there to begin with. And I think the way that we all do it, I think a lot of it has to do with the, the technical aspect of what Monday night, uh, the ABC crew does on Monday night. I think it's really good. I think it's the best that any network does that. So I think it's a combination of those things. I like to show up to hear what Howard has to say, too. It's interesting. I think I, Don touched on it. Uh, first of all, it's a great night. It's live television. It's happening now. We have football at its very peak. The players we know perform differently, uh, maybe a few degrees better than they're really capable of performing. We bring that to the audience uh, 
what we bring really is a great product. Uh, the technicians that we have are superb. Of course, our schedule by and large is good. Uh, when it's not, we know it's not because they don't watch. Uh, and the chemistry between the three of us, for whatever it's worth, we are totally different. I have heard people say that they don't get along. Don's fighting with Howard. Howard's fighting with me. Howard's fighting with all of us. That's just simply not true. We've known each other for years. Uh, we respect each other individually as individuals. And I think that is what makes up what you term the chemistry between us. Doesn't he sometimes make him mad just a little bit? Oh, you bet you. He's been mad a lot. Yeah. What's he really like, Purcell? Really different. <laughs> <laughs> Monday Night Football Fever. A decade of the NFL on ABC. The executive producer of ABC Sports is Rune Arley. Monday Night Football Fever was produced by Chet Bordy. Directed by Joe Assetti and Roger Goodman. Associate producers Peter Englehart and David Downs. Associate directors Rob Biner, Bob Dekas, Bob Rosberg, and Tony Slotkin. Technical director Mike Blazo. Stay tuned, except on the West Coast, for a special Thursday night edition of ABC's Monday Night Football with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers hosting the Los Angeles Rams. Travel arrangements made through and a promotional fee paid by United Airlines. United flies more people to Hawaii than any other airline. That's what friendly skies are all about. This has been an ABC Sports Presentation.